there is a world that lies beyond good and evil, beyond right and wrong, beyond pleasure and pain. There's no signpost that would announce this world. There's no going to this world. It's a world that is so close it is hiding in plain sight. It is the real you. There's no journey there. You're already here. Welcome to Non-Duality Talk. I'm Jerry Katz. My guest is Jeannie McGilvery, who's speaking to us from the Shropshire Hills within the county of Shropshire, located in the West Midlands of England. The Shropshire Hills area is designated as an area of outstanding natural beauty, which means it's a conservation area of significant landscape value. It's located within the English countryside, Wales and Northern Ireland. And I think Jeannie's been designated a non-dual woman of outstanding natural beauty, which I think which you're about to find out. She runs an infotech business from her home with her husband, Paul. Jeannie and Paul also run the non-duality website, meetingtruth.com. Here's Jeannie McGilvery. Talking about this is just my favorite subject. I could talk about it day in, day out for the rest of my life. It doesn't have an agenda. Part of this, what we're waking up to, is this profound equality. There can be no hierarchy. So the whole teacher and student dynamic is being reinvented. Whenever I've had any kind of interaction with a teacher, it's never been held in higher esteem than an interaction with a child or an interaction with an animal or with a fellow right. worker. Jeannie talks about her apprenticeship with Rupert Spira when he was a potter. And it was only afterward that Rupert became an internationally known non-duality teacher. And we find out what Jeannie learned as an apprentice to Rupert. When I knew Rupert, he wasn't a non-duality teacher. He was a very famous potter. So I, yeah. was, I was his apprentice. I was um, helping glaze pots and helping with the firing and helping with his orders. So what did you learn as an apprentice? The idea was to learn the actual practicalities of making pots. But what I learned the most at Rupert's was management. Because orders would come in and pots would need to be made. They would need to be glazed. They would need to be fired. Orders would need to be boxed up and all that kind of thing. So I actually learned how to ma sort of how to manage the whole life cycle of making something really and also i would say that i learned an enormous amount of real aesthetic appreciation you know for shape and form and color and i feel that one of the things one of the ma most important lessons that i learned at rupert's was honesty which is just so fundamentally important to any kind of spiritual experience, you know, spiritual truth. The general feeling was what I really feel that I was there to learn really was just that total self-honesty. Here you'll see how Jeannie applies this self-honesty to dealing with reactions, thoughts, emotions, specifically jealousy. What is going on? Am I, how am I feeling? How, what reaction is being is arising up in, in, say there's an altercation, that's always a good, a good example. So if there's a difficult conversation or, or a tricky experience or a repeated sensation that might come up. So for lots of people, it might be jealousy, all related to what they're thinking. That I have always found absolutely fascinating. What is going on there? What is what being is held or believed, the more intimate we become with those, whatever it might be, a repeated emotion or a repeated belief, the more it dissipates, the more it's known and really brought into experience and really seen for what it is, they seem to thin out. They don't seem to have the same kind of grip. If a thought is coming up, say it's a jealousy thing, 
he he fancies her, let's say that or something. If that comes up, if that's seen and not just believed, it seems to lose its power. It seems to lose its impact, and it doesn't seem if it's seen as as an illusion, if it's seen as something an absolute fantasy, then it doesn't have that follow through of belief. So it's, they seem to thin out. What is it that's aware of that? You know, the whole dynamic. Jeannie McGilvery talks about her psychologically painful teen years, her parents growing up, meeting Francis Lucille, and talking about how life is the teacher. And then there's a musical interlude from Arupa Gold, which lead singer is Ella McGilvery, and it's Jeannie's and Paul's daughter. From there, Jeannie talks about experiencing a truthful life and grace and being responsible for her misery, being ruled by thoughts and emotions. And, of mm. whatever's going on in our interior world or in relation to experience, what is it that knows that? I've never felt like a human. I've never felt no. like a, a separate thing. So when you grow up in society and society starts to shape you into a separate thing, for me it was in my teenage years, I found that an excruciatingly painful <laughs> And so, I, mean, I think because it happened quite later on in life, I was very lucky in that my brother and sister are a lot older than me. So I really had two sets of parents. By the time I was three, my brother was 18. No, my sister was 18 and my wow. brother was 16. I kind of had two sets of parents. I was very yeah. loved as a child. Um, my parents were comfortably off. They weren't wealthy. They were lived in a small kind of what you would call a council house in the UK, in a street with a lamppost outside my window. Three little three tiny three bedroom house. But I didn't really have any sense of lack. I didn't have any dramatic childhood experiences. I had two sets of extraordinarily loving parents. And yeah. my parents were quite they were working class but they were very they didn't really have money worries, and I went to a school, a tiny little school. It wasn't until probably I was 13 that I started to, that, that, you know, that there started to be a little bit of bullying at school, and people start, there started to be competitivity amongst the girls as puberty came in, really. When I discovered a biter, I still had a memory of not being, not thinking I was the body mind. I still had a kind of visceral memory of a whole knowing of that. And it was it was as if when I would read um the Shankaracharya's books, it was as if he was just reminding me. He was just taking me back to my kind of pre teen experience. It was very fresh in my memory and very it was like coming home into a new family. And actually so one of the things that I really got from Francis Lucille, there was one time where I went to ask him a question in satsang, and as I went to ask the question, it absolutely fell out of my mind, and I just looked at him with nothing going on in my mind at all. I wasn't even particularly aware of the fact that it had been ages, and everyone was looking at me, and I hadn't asked the question. I wasn't even really aware that I'd lost the question. So I wasn't, the mind wasn't searching for the question. It was as I went to ask the question, the question fell out of my mind and nothing else went in to replace it. So there was this, just this moment of, it was like complete suspended animation. And I was looking off, I wasn't actually looking at Francis, I was looking off. But I was still there. And I looked at Francis, and he just pointed at me and just went, there, that's it. And there was that, there was this um, shocking, it was, you know, it was actually shocking that I've been doing that my entire life. Those moments when you're a kid of daydreaming, where you just look off, and there's, you're just a pure being, there's nothing going on. And I've been dismissing those as kind of childish daydreaming or but actually it was so it's so natural to just be our innate being to be contentless 
and contextless, but to just be. But it was it was a huge shock and such a, a gift as well, not to not for the mind to kind of jump in and dismiss that as just childish behaviour or daydreaming or a waste of time or but it was also it was such a revelation that but I've been doing that my entire life. The beautiful thing is that if that hadn't happened, you know, if I'd have just gone on to ask the question, whatever the question was, that whole revelation which has last stayed with me for twenty years would not have happened. And that's how life is the teacher. It wasn't anything specific about Francis as a teacher. You know, obviously he was there to point and to recognise that, which is absolutely priceless. But the whole thing is like a setup of life. You know, the whole moment was like, it was one of those standout moments in our lives, one of those absolutely awe-inspiring significant moments of grace that you cannot manufacture and aren't really about any specific person but they're so significant and so much a part of an ongoing spiritual unfoldment. Grace has played, played a huge role in my life and I only call it grace because I have no rationale for it at all. I have no, no explanation or at all, and couldn't say that it was, I could not say that I am responsible for my own happiness, because I was responsible for my misery, you know, I, you know, I was miserable, I was totally miserable, <laughs> and I was totally believing this television show that goes on in the mind, I was absolutely ruled by it. I totally believed it. You know, if it told me that people always let me down and I can't trust anybody or whatever it was saying, I totally believed it. The whole tragic story of life. I remember having an argument with Paul once. I don't even know what the argument was about. It's irrelevant, really. I remember we were having this argument as couples do, and I remember throwing myself onto the bed, bed and wailing, you know, as if it was some kind of Shakespearean tragedy, that life was tragic, and waking up to the fact that that is all an illusion is shocking, <laughs> that that is all imaginary. Does that make me cry? the world is a stage and the men and women merely players, you see yourself on the stage. You see yourself having this core wound upon which are a whole pile of beliefs and upon which is a whole story around that, a whole tragic sort of Shakespearean tragedy. And then that, when that is all seen, that whole dynamic is all realized it's shocking yeah my conversation with Jeannie McGilvery from meetingtruth.com continues and here Jeannie talks about aliveness of awareness and the unknowingness of life and I've always been very fascinated with our aliveness that what? sense that we have what do you mean by aliveness well when you talk about awareness when you become aware that you're aware and that that's kind of like, wow, I'm aware, I'm aware. That awareness that we're aware of isn't flat. It has a quality of its own aliveness. So that sense of aliveness absolutely infuses the entirety of our experience. So awareness isn't vacant. It's full of aliveness. When you get absolutely plunged in the true unknowingness of life and the absolute aliveness of life, 
then you really do feel drunk. I was actually crying my heart out in the bar. I was really at the lowest I've ever been as a human being. And I had my, I was leaning over, I had my eyes closed in the bath. And I was just absolutely sobbing. And I, all of a sudden I had this invitation to die as Jeannie. And I, because I was so low and I was so sick of being Jeannie, that I followed, there was like a movement, internal movement to follow this invitation. And it was like I fell into this void and I've only ever heard Adi Shanti talk about it actually. I went on a retreat last, this summer just gone, a seven day silent retreat with Adi Shanti and I was shocked on the first day you get this piece of paper, true meditation, and the very last line talks about this void of pure potentiality, this void of vital aliveness, a vitally alive void of pure potentiality. And I was so shocked because this is exactly what happened in the bath. I literally, I fell into, the whole world fell away, sensations, emotions, perceptions, the visual world, any kind of experience fell away. And I kind of fell into, or became, this void of pure potentiality. And it was vital aliveness. And I remember when I came out, I was so shocked. I leapt out of the bath and I was just running around upstairs in the house. And I was just going, fuck! I was so shocked! It was like a massive... I literally, I leapt, actually leapt out of the bath and I was running around the top floor of the house and I was so shocked because everything that the mind went to say about it wasn't true because it wasn't there. The mind wasn't there in a way that there weren't any thoughts in that place, there wasn't any, there weren't any emotions. There weren't any sense perceptions at all, but I was there. I was it. Mm. And it was so shocking because it meant that everything that I thought I was, I wasn't. Everything I thought I was was dependent upon that. Okay, that, that, that this vital aliveness was the source and the substance of the entire, of creation, the, of the entire creation. It was the source and the substance of all things. And that was the kind of real turning point. That was the point where it ignited a, 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 an obsessive compulsive inquiry that went on for about four years. What was the inquiry about? Into what everything. Was it? How does, how, what is drinking? What is eating? How does, how is driving really experienced? How is sensation really experienced? What's it like to really be in a bed? Um, what is sleep? It, it, it couldn't be unseen. It couldn't be unknown. So it changed my entire life. Now I know I'm not my thoughts. I'm not my sensations. I'm not my emotions in the way that I previously thought I was because all of that disappeared and I was still there. There was, no, there was no longer that division of internal and external. So the inquiry was into everything, every single emotion, sensation, perception, everything that we would say is in the world. So where is everything in the world in relation to what I am? How does it eat? How does it sleep? How does it touch? How is, where is sensation? That went on for about four years. And during that period, there were moments of real kind of revelation, and it was very, you know, luminous kind of revelation 
but that it was also insatiable. It was also also kind of irritating at times because I would literally wake up in the night having been inquiring into sleep, and so it would it the, you know there was real disturbed sleep patterns. So mm. it was. Con and it was constant. It wasn't like there were periods of meditation or periods of nice hour-long sessions of inquiry. It was 24-7. Was there an event or an, a, a, a time when the inquiry kind of resolved? Yeah, I went to an um, intensive with Ajashanti. And at that point, I'd become totally lost in consciousness. I would be on the tube absolutely just drowning in consciousness looking at me through all these pairs of eyes on the tube and the, I would kind of, I was sort of, it was dysfunctional in a conventional sense at that point mm. and there was, um, Adia had a weekend in London and right at the end, and I was so moved, I cried all weekend, <laughs> kind of just silently wept just with all the recognition of his, his teaching and what he was talking about, just it was just really moving. And I can have quite a shy personality, so I don't really like going up and asking questions or anything like that. So I was determined not to ask a question at this weekend. And right at the end of the weekend, I saw my arm go up in the air. And kind of, you kind of go, oh no! And he chose me immediately! And it was, I, you know, it was, I knew it was going to happen and I was trying to avoid it. And I went up to the microphone and I said, what looks out of my eyes looks out of your eyes and everybody else's eyes and it sees itself wherever, wherever it looks. And he just said, I would trust that if I were you. That was like a, a, a setting. That kind of, I would, I trust that really was the moment where all the the whole kind of in, incessant inquiry kind of settled down. Does that make me crazy? Does that make been listening to Jeannie McGilvery on Non-Duality Talk. Her website is meetingtruth.com. And we heard Jeannie talk about self-honesty, awareness as aliveness, and the mystery of life, among many other topics. Our opening and closing music is by Prosad from the Transitar album. You also heard John Coltrane playing Giant Steps from the Giant Steps album. And that was Arupa Gold playing and singing the song Crazy from their album entitled Arupa Gold. This is Non-Duality Talk. Our website, which features past shows, is nonduality.org. I'm Jerry Cass.